Okay, as people continue to log in, I'll get us started. Thank you so much for joining our roundtable discussion on how philanthropy can support the ongoing and widespread relief, recovery, and rebuilding efforts as a result of Russia's war on Ukraine. We are so excited that you have joined us for today's conversation. A few call reminders before we get started. At this time, all attendees are encouraged to change their name in the participant list to include your name and organization. And I encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat and where you're calling in from. Automated live transcript is available in the Zoom settings at the bottom of your screen if you select to show captions or view full transcript. Throughout today's conversation, we encourage you to utilize all the features on the Zoom platform, including raising your hand, coming off mute, and engaging in the chat. If you have any questions or dif uh, technical difficulties at any point during today's call, please reach out to council staff, which is myself, Zainab, or Natalie. And today's event is being recorded and will be shared alongside resources and takeaways. With that, I'm so excited to hand it off to Natalie Ross. Great, thanks everyone. We're glad you're here. My name is Natalie Ross. I'm one of the vice presidents at the Council on Foundations and we're honored to host today's call in partnership with our peer philanthropic networks in Canada. So Community Foundations of Canada, Philanthropic Foundations of Canada and always in partnership with one of our members, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. As uh, Melissa said, this is part of our donor roundtable, a series of conversations about Ukraine. We've been convening foundations on the crisis um, since 2022 and um, this year have continued to focus on different topics and how they connect to the situation on the ground. So this month, we're excited to talk about education and learn a bit more about what funders should think about when they think about supporting education in Ukraine, given the current context, but also how that's relevant um, to education settings elsewhere in the world. Uh, so we're excited to have great speakers with us. Um, and as always, uh, this year, we've been in partnership with Adrian, uh, who will be moderating the conversation and introducing it for us. So Adrian, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks, Natalie. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Adrian Carmesen. I'm glad you could all join us today. We have a fantastic group of experts uh, here to take us through some of the innovative approaches that are being implemented to help Ukrainian youth proceed with their education despite the war. Of course, all wars are ruinous, but uh, this one is particularly horrific because Russia is deliberately targeting the civilian population and infrastructure, including schools. In our last session, we talked about the ecocide being caused by Russia's destruction of Ukraine's environment. Uh, perhaps the term for what we're talking about today is future side that is Russia's efforts to destroy the future of Ukrainian children. So starting us off will be Anna Novosad, uh, besides talking about the efforts of her organization, Save Ed, we've also asked Anna to provide uh, a broader overview of the education system in Ukraine and the reforms that Ukrainians have been implementing even before the war. It's a subject she knows well because she served uh, as Minister of Education of Ukraine in 2019-2020. Uh, Anna, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Adrian, and I appreciate uh, this invitation uh, of the Council. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm just going to briefly share my screen with you. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, yeah, greetings from, from Ukraine, from, from Kyiv. Um, a few words on myself. Uh, I used to work uh, for the Minister of Education and Science for many, many years, starting day one after the Revolution of Dignity in 2014, and I resigned in 2020 as the minister, and I was uh, honored uh, to witness and also to contribute to the to this reforms and especially the school education reform that was started uh, in Ukraine uh, before the big war uh, back in 2017. Uh, I know that uh, people uh, usually know quite a little about Ukraine and this uh, huge invasion of Russia against us kind of opened up a lot of things uh, about us. Uh, however, just to give you kind of a glimpse of uh, Ukrainian uh, school education, uh, it's been, you know, I would say that the, the, the biggest uh, point to take away of, of this uh, conversation is that it's been quite good. And this is also something that Ukrainians who were forced to go um, abroad are now witnessing is that Ukrainian schools haven't been bad. 
had and the quality of education was relatively um, comparable to the OECD average. And this is what also PISA um, assessment that we took uh, part in as a country in 2018 uh, showed that Ukrainian school education is averaging uh, those uh, countries that are in OECD average um, ranking um, as a government. And I'll say like a couple of governments in a row after the revolution of dignity invested a lot resources and effort into the school reform. And in 2017, we started a huge um, uh, transformation, uh, which was called the new Ukrainian uh, school reform. I know that in the US uh, transformations and various uh, turnarounds and, and various uh, policies to to transform ed school education are happening uh, all the time and are very much state-based. However, in Ukraine, that was probably the first um, systemic effort to comprehensively change curriculum, to train half a million teachers, and to invest billions of, uh, of hryvnas, which is like millions of dollars, uh, into the um, uh, into the uh, transformation of the educational environment. And what's also important is that thanks to the reform, tens and tens of thousands of kids with special education needs were actually able finally to go to just regular schools instead of um, sitting at home. But then uh, Russia decided that um, they have to liberate us, liberate us from our um, normal lives. And um, by today, as, as we are speaking in this uh, more than 19 months of the big war, um, Russia has destroyed every 10th school in Ukraine. Uh, and that's huge, right? Before the war, we had roughly 15,000 general secondary schools. Uh, and uh, but yeah, by today, more than 1,500 are uh, either uh, destroyed beyond uh, repair. So they are being bombed with avia bombs, the missiles, or they are damaged uh, uh, severely and need um, reconstruction. And just so you know, one of the things that I would really like you to take away from this presentation is that this doesn't happen uh, accidentally. This is a very, very, um, um, how to say, very deliberate, very cynical, and very strategic um, thing to do. And it's a part of a broader strategy to erase Ukrainians as a nation, because they very much understand, I mean, Russians, that uh, having access to education means having access to the source of knowledge, means having access to the source of democracy, to the um, sort of like community gathering. And uh, if you look at what they do when they occupy, uh, when they uh, yeah occupy cities or towns or villages, maybe the second or third thing what they that they do, they um, bring their teachers, they burn Ukrainian books, they install Russian programs, and try and start their propaganda. Um, and just, you know, like I, I was, I said that every 10 school is destroyed and, uh, I know you might not really know the geography of Ukraine and you might think that the war is happening somewhere only on the borders. Um, thanks to the Ukrainian army, uh, the front line is now not that huge as it was a year ago. However, the destruction of schools per se is happening all over the country. This is for instance, the Tomar Lyceum. It's, um, 20, uh, it's 200 kilometers from Kyiv to the West. War in terms of like ground troops has never uh, came that far. However, this this lyceum was destroyed by a missile last March. Uh, this is in the north of the country. This little village was in occupation, and while was occupied by Russians, they also hit it uh, with a missile, and a couple of uh, people died. Um, this is Chernihiv. Chernihiv. Uh, for me, it was the first city that I started working with after the full-scale invasion and the first city that I visited that was um, liberated. It was surrounded for a month and a half. And uh, this is one of the many schools that Russians were dropping like day by day, super heavy bombs. Um, and so this city, it was a city with 250 inhabitant 250,000 inhabitants before the big war. And uh, Russians damaged here 27 out of uh, 34 schools. So just for you to understand the scale of damage. Um, this is South Mykolaiv. It's a huge city of almost half a million uh, people. And in every district of this huge city, uh, they have a one destroyed school um, like this. So um, myself, before the, before the big invasion, I was actually in the US. I was doing a fellowship at Vanderbilt University. However, just like just in case I, I return home uh, three days before the big war and um, I choose to stay there. 
And after the Ukrainian uh, army liberated the north, uh, and for us, we first of all, everyone saw Bucha, but then we also, we as educators, we saw the, the damage to educational system uh, per se. And this is how me and, and the team uh, decided that, okay, we, we have to do something. Like a lot of Ukrainians, like Oksana, like Katerina, whom you see here, uh, they just thought like, okay, we have to do something. And that something uh, later on kind of manifested itself in Save Ed, which is a charitable foundation that I've co-founded with my colleagues. And our mission is to restore access uh, to education in the war-damaged uh, communities. We are currently present in this six uh, uh, regions. Uh, it's still not enough. However, uh, it's uh, what we managed to do in basically just one year of our operation. And uh, within this year, we managed to help more than 40,000 school kids um, around the country. This number could be higher. However, um, when you look at the map of occupation, for instance, and then liberation, you could see that uh, Russians, the Russians mostly occupy uh, villages, little towns. They didn't manage to capture big cities, thankfully, thanks to Ukrainian army and the US support to that end. Uh, and that means that liberated rural areas have been vulnerable before, but now they are even in even in more um, uh, terrible conditions. Um, this is just to give you a sense. So this is Ministry of Education data, just to give you a sense of what's what's happening in with education right now. So um, just just imagine it's the fourth September. It's a fourth study year when Ukrainian kids uh, do not go normally to schools. First two years of COVID, now two years of big war. So um, that means that we have basically a generation of primary school kids, those who attend first, second, third, fourth grade, who have never been to schools or have rarely or barely uh, been to been to schools. And that's, of, uh, of course, uh, predominantly east uh, and uh, and south of the country where the uh, which are closer to the, to the front line. So currently, uh, in total, more than 2 million kids are studying either online or uh, in a blended mode, uh, which means that like all of you went through COVID and those of you who have kids, you understand what kind of learning that is. And add to that constant bombing, air raid sirens, um, stolen by Russians' devices and bombed schools. And this is the picture that we have now um, in Ukraine. And of course, that already has a huge toll on the human um, capital of uh, of the country here. So just briefly, what do we do at Save Ad in pictures? Uh, yeah, as you saw, the scale of destruction is huge. So one of the, our priorities, I I call us like, um, you know, um, emergency in education response. Uh, we try to follow the Ukrainian army and kind of be there as fast as we can when the situation is, is safe. So we do, for instance, temporary schools. This is uh, like 20 kilometers from Kyiv, where I'm now, it's very close to the capital. It was uh, This village was uh, in, uh, occupied by Russians. They lived in this school. Uh, the school was for 400 um, kids. And in this kindergarten, they this is like 100 meters from that school, they kept their ammunition. And when they were retrieving, they exploded it. So this village is just one of numerous examples where educational infrastructure is completely gone. But they have kids. And when we started to work in this community, we uh, found out that this uh, kind of community house, in American terms, I would say, uh, was intact from the outside. And uh, we agreed with the local authorities that, okay, we will try to do something there. This is how it looked um, before, before we started working in there, just bare walls, basically. And we realized, okay, it's a great place, like 400 square meters for temporary school. So we completely renovated it, divided it into four big primary classrooms. Uh, and now all primary school kids, almost uh, like 180 school kids attend this uh, this temporary school, and they perhaps will do that for the next five to six years when this village has um, funds to start rebuilding what's been uh, what's been destroyed by Russians. Uh, one of our actually main um, streams of work are the digital learning center. This is uh, what we invented, and this is what I'm really grateful. We op operate and uh, cooperate with uh, the next two speakers, Oksana and Katerina, with Teach for Ukraine and also with Engine. So the DLC is, is basically an um, emergency instrument to renew access at least to any educational activities. We arrange them like a, it's basically like a huge classroom that we arranged in the bomb shelter or in whatever is intact in the village. 
and we completely arrange it with like, with furniture, devices, computers, projectors. But what's most important with tutors and structured curriculum, for instance, Engine is helping us to um, to do the English classes in these spaces and uh, Teach for Ukraine, for instance, last uh, academic year, they helped us to prepare kids for the ex uh, university entrance exams in these places. And we pay tutors to, to work here. We currently run a network of almost uh, 50 centers like that around five regions that we work with. The bomb shelters is something new to our life, unfortunately, and unfortunately, it will stay for us for a very long time. So uh, at Safe Ed, we look at this horrible underground uh, claustrophobic places as something inevitable and something that we have to use for the educational purposes. So we completely turn them into learning spaces. And this is just one of the examples for It's not Kyiv, so it's Chernihiv Oblast. Uh, it's on, right on the border. They are unlucky to be on the border with both Belarus and Russia. And uh, these kids stayed for a year at home. They were not allowed to go anywhere. And this is the first time when they attended something in person was the bomb shelter that we arranged into a digital learning center. Yeah, and this is just one of the numerous examples of, of what we uh, do. And Basically, by doing that, but also by restoring, uh, rehabilitating schools, uh, turning these shelter, bomb shelters into schools, uh, constructing modular schools, we helped this uh, around 40,000 kids to get back access to at least some uh, educational activities. I cannot call it proper learning, but it's much better than nothing. And we also see that kids who suffered occupation, they need the socialization the most. And one of the... Uh, projects that I'm most proud about is uh, called You Active. We do it with our very uh, uh, loved and cherished partner, Spirit of America. It's the US-based NGO. Uh, these All these kids you see on the picture have been in occupation. They lived for months and a half in Kyiv uh, region under uh, Russian occupation. Uh, they saw how their kids, how their mates have been killed, how their uh, elderly have been killed so that th these kids went through a lot and so uh for these kids and for others we invented you uh, active it's an eight-week uh, civic education program where we when we where we teach them uh community service basics and uh, equip them to uh, design and implement their projects that are about recovery and are about um, uh, doing things better in their communities and uh, in their schools uh within this year we managed to help 54 schools, which is, you know, it's a drop in the ocean in comparison to the damage. However, these this, this few um, directions remain our priorities, restoring premises, equipping schools, uh, arranging bomb shelters. But what's most valuable that we do, and thanks to partners also like Teach for Ukraine and Engine, we provide them with structured learning. And we also engage tutors who work with them either offline uh, or online. So basically it's combined an infrastructural uh, recovery with um, soft measures. And just to give you a sense of whom we work with, um, we just uh, chosen those who are who might be known to you. So it's uh, American Council, Spirit of America, IREX, uh, well, UNICEF, obviously, <laughs> everyone knows about them. However, we, we kind of try to focus on also on the, on the US partners, especially in this EU active program, because we believe that uh, Americans and Canadians to that, uh, to that uh, end as well, understand the value of community service and understand the value of uh, engaging kids um, to that. Uh, we are always happy to partner. We are always happy to find common ground, how to how to engage. And uh, just to give a kind of uh, a, a hint or a ball to the next speakers, I, I appreciate that uh, all three of us, and there are many, many others organizations here, we all work together and we try to combine the efforts how to um, remedy this uh, situation here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Excellent presentation. Uh, next, we have uh, Oksana Matyash, who heads Teach for Ukraine, uh, a program that focuses on rural and frontline schools in Ukraine. I also want to start off by congratulating Oksana. She's coming to us from New York. Uh, she's at Columbia University. Uh, this academic year as an Obama Foundation uh, scholar. Oksana, over to you. Thank you, Adrian. I do appreciate it. It's such an honor to speak uh, in front of such a distinguished audience, but also after Anna, I was uh, telling in the beginning that it's always hard to uh, meet the expectations um, after her 
Um, so as uh, Adrian already mentioned, I am here temporarily in New York as the Obama Foundation Scholar, but I am first and foremost the CEO of Teach for Ukraine. Um, I also serve on the on the board of uh, President Zelensky's Foundation on Support to Science, Education and Sports. Um, just a few facts about me. But the most important thing is, of course, uh, that I'm here today to talk about um, an amazing work of um, our organization. So Teach for Ukraine is a local NGO that was founded in 1217. Uh, um, we relaunched the organization in 2020 after COVID when I joined um, in October as the CEO. Uh, we're also part of the Teach for All Global Network, which is present in 60 countries. And I know um, probably most of you have heard about Teach for America. So um, we do operate not similar, but we're part of the same um, organizations working to ensure uh, that every child has um, equitable education opportunities. We're headquartered in uh, Kyiv, Ukraine, and currently we have 35 permanent team members. This is just to um, give you the overview of um, the organization itself. Um, as every decent NGO, we of course have the mission and our mission is to ensure that every child in Ukraine can fulfill their potential through access to high quality education despite their place of birth or residence. And of course, it's especially during the war. So here on the on the left, you can see a photo from um, one of our activities that we did in the European that I'll speak later about. Um, so the core program, the core model of uh, Teach for Ukraine, as I said, um, has a lot to draw from Teach for America's model, uh, but the context is very different. So we also recruit and train uh, dedicated graduates of the best Ukraine university, uh, as well as uh, professionals who are ready to commit to teaching in rural schools for at least two years. But not only do they teach there, they also act as role models and uh, mentors for kids organizing free extracurricular activities and community-based projects. And I will explain uh, why our focus is on, um, has been on rural areas primarily. By the way, this is the, the photo of our cohort from 2021, 2023. Um, and two people in these photos have voluntarily joined the armed forces. Um, teachers of history of Ukraine, um, they couldn't stand, uh, they couldn't, you know, just uh, stay in a the classroom. They said, we need, I need to be shaping the history of Ukraine myself and be um, uh, an example for my students. So we're super proud of them. Um, so Teach for Ukraine before 24th of February 2022 has been a different organization, um, and you will hear later why. Um, but we were always focusing on addressing the problem of education um, inequity in Ukraine. Uh, before the war, as Anna mentioned, there was a, an international study conducted called PISA uh, that showed that kids from rural areas are almost two and a half years behind in their knowledge and skills from their peers from uh, urban areas. So the city or the place where you're born is really very, um, is gonna define in most of the cases, a child's future. Um, so as I said, we were focusing on placing our fellows and teachers in rural areas. And here on the right, you see the map of Ukraine. Uh, we have been uh, working primarily in the five regions of Ukraine. It's Kiev uh, here in the north, Dnipro in the east, Odessa in the south, and Vivivan from Kievsk here in the western part of Ukraine. Um, and before the war, the large scale invasion started, we had 40 fellows in our um, 18 school partners. But when um, when the war started, uh, all of our fellows were located here in their communities and they refused to uh, get evacuated because they all wanted to stay and support their children. Um, one of our fellows was uh, Yulia uh, Stanowska. You see her on the right photo. And um, a week after the war um, started, the invasion started, uh, she got killed by the Russian missile when she was providing humanitarian aid to uh, residents in her native hometown, Kharkiv. It's on the border with Russia. And Yulia also refused to get evacuated because she was always the person who stayed uh, in the most challenging circumstances to help people. And um, this was the most um, challenging, but also transformative moments in the life of Teach for Ukraine's community, because after her death, we came together and we realized that Yulia would want us to continue doing what we're doing. And we had her mother coming, joining the graduation ceremony of her cohort, um, telling us that Yulia has been happiest with our community and the best way we can honor her memory would be to continue doing what we were doing. 
and uh, Yule will be uh, forever 21. This is just to give you one example of how devastating is uh, the war on uh, not only Ukraine's education, but on its future as well, first and foremost. So as a response to the large-scale invasion, Teach for Ukraine started, launched emergency response, and we had uh, two uh, big priorities. First, it was about providing uh, urgent mental health and psychosocial support both to teachers and uh, students, um, because like you can't work on providing education or excellence uh, or provide academic excellence if you have the majority of your beneficiaries who are under huge stress and don't feel um, in a safe space. Um, and of course, it was about renewing the um, immediate academic um, access to education to those children who couldn't access any online education because when the large scale invasion started, many, many schools couldn't provide any kind of learning because um, teachers were on the move. Um, they didn't have the capacity. So this is where Teach for Ukraine started our project that I will tell briefly about later. So here in the bottom, you can see our partners who helped us uh, during the emergency response launch. Um, UNICEF, they just saved the children, World Bank, Bosch Foundation, Skull Foundation, Teach for All, of course. And uh, we were able to impact a significant number of those teachers and children. So as I mentioned to you, one of our priority, uh, priorities was to um, provide MHPSS support. And this is one of our biggest projects called Together for Teachers. Um, and on the right, you see the photo of uh, one of our trainings that we did in one of our uh, partner schools. You can feel like it's an intimate atmosphere, but it was actually after another attack by Russia on our civilian infrastructure. There was no electricity, but we still kept uh, going doing our work. Um, this project is, is about professional development course and trauma sensitive approach to teaching um, offsite visits to um, provide direct MHPSS support on the ground. We developed also chatbots, digital tools uh, to provide immediate tax based support to a teacher if they um, come across a challenging situation during a lesson so that they know which strategies they can apply. And of course, it was cre about creating this peer to peer groups so that um, teachers can have um, self-support among their own community. Uh, and we were able to reach almost more, now it's more than 90,000 educators in Ukraine with this response. The project that I'm most proud of actually, and Anna, um, she helped, she really was at the beginning and made it possible because back in April, 2022, um, we were thinking about how to support children in the best way possible. And she introduced me to colleagues from the World Bank that were also planning to pilot a tutoring um, approach um, in Ukraine. So this is how we came up with this project uh, called Educational Scoop, which was the first uh, program in Ukraine to recover uh, learning losses. And our approach is about uh, small group tutoring, uh, offering individualized support to students. We are uh, focusing on addressing uh, gaps um, across three subjects. Um, it's like foundational subjects, math, Ukrainian language, and the history of Ukraine. And this project has also a strong um, psychosocial support component because a lot of children that we work with, especially children from the frontline region, they have lost their motivation to learn. They don't see a value in education. So for us, it's about first and foremost, helping them to believe in themselves again, and believe in the power of education and supporting them along this uh, journey. So here at the bottom, you can see some numbers. Um, in total, since April 2022, we've been able to support 18,000 children. Um, we've um, trained uh, 600 tutors. Most of them are public school teachers in Ukraine uh, who directly take part in implementing, delivering tutoring classes. And at some point, we had um, 3,000 online live classes uh, per week. So you can't, you can't even imagine how um, crazy the schedule was. Um, and of course, the um, most important part is um, our new cohort of teachers that we recruited during the war. Uh, you can see them on the photo. Um, this is the photo of our new cohort with some of their students. Um, we took this photo during the summer uh, healing camp that we organized for um, children in the Kyiv region who were also suffered um, after the after the occupation. Um, we deeply believe at Teach for Ukraine that first you unlock the student's potential and then they unlock the potential of the country. So 
So one of our big goals is to um, reach out to as many young Ukrainians as possible and give them the opportunity to give back to the country um, by participating in Teach for Ukraine and educating the next generation of um, young Ukrainians. Um, this is this is basically it. Um, I don't have a specific ask to you. I think uh, my my general message would be just if you see um, or you heard something where you would like to, you know, get connected, get in touch, or help us with uh, you know building any any connections that might assist us in um, working on 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 the priorities that I spoke about today, um, that would be uh, more than helpful. I'm here now based in the U.S., so I'm very open to have any conversations, like talk about this more to people and let them know about what's happening um, on the ground or with uh, Anna and Katerina. I think we're here as a joint force for sure, because all of us need to work on making sure that children in Ukraine can still uh, continue having access to high quality education um, despite the war. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oksana, for your excellent presentation. I think we've all been uh, impressed over the last uh, 18 months or so as uh, when we uh, watch the news on TV and see how many uh, people from Ukraine uh, speak English so well. And uh, uh, and I think maybe perhaps part of the credit can go to our next speaker, uh, Katerina uh, Manoff, uh, who heads the ENGINE program, uh, which uh, basically partners thousands of uh, Ukrainians and Americans for uh online uh, English, uh, conversational English. And I think it'll become an evident in your talk about, uh, I, I would even wonder if you were somewhat inspired by uh, the sharing economy model in the US, uh, Uber and uh, uh, you know Airbnb uh, in the way that you have kind of tapped this uh, uh, resource, unt uh, untapped resource, if you will, of a uh, so many English speakers here in the U.S. being available to help you out on your project. Katerina? Thank you, Adrian. And um, you are right. Um, some of the young people we saw on national television in the first days of the war were actually engine students because that is um, what we did when the war started. Uh, we we used our voices and and our stories. But let me jump jump back and um, and tell you a little bit about engine. Um, so. First of all, thank you for having me today. I'm Katarina and I'm um, really eager to share uh, Engine's story with you. So as I think we've um, we've been hearing um, about educational experiences in Ukraine and one thing that um, is pretty clear um, is the wide diversity of educational experiences that Ukrainian children are having um, in, um, in the context of war. So we have some young people who are learning in intact school buildings. Um, others have been forced to um, study completely online thanks to attacks by Russia. Uh, some young people are temporarily living abroad and attempting to learn from there, and some are not enrolled in school at all. So when we talk about what young people in Ukraine need today, there's not always one clear answer. Uh, is it better prepared teachers, uh, repaired school buildings, devices to help with online learning, innovative curricula, or is it something else? I think that across this dizzying array of educational experiences, some needs are universal and chief among them is the need for connection. And that is what we focus on at Engine. We offer a one-of-a-kind program that reaches uh, Ukrainian youth wherever they may be, online, offline, out of the country, or out of the formal education system entirely. Our model might sound pretty simple. Uh, we pair young Ukrainians with English speakers for free weekly hour-long conversation practice sessions. And you may be thinking, is that it? But stay with me, um, because a lot actually happens in, in um, this kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, it's... Um, it's, it's pretty special, actually. So the first piece is this rapid improvement in spoken English, which uh, was actually the motivation for starting Engine in the first place. Um, most young Ukrainians today have studied English, but have not had an opportunity to speak it in real world context. Uh, so the, the approach is much more memorizing conjugations rather than having conversations. So when we put them in a Zoom with a fluent speaker one on one, we have maximum speaking time in a safe and comfortable environment. And within a few months, they gain the confidence to actually use the real language in real life. And 
this skill is essential for young people in Ukraine of whether whether they will build careers in IT or business or government or education, the sciences, the arts, and I could go on. Um, it is it is such a universal and important skill that can help set them up for, for academic and professional success. But that's just the first piece. Our sessions are also a launching pad for tailored academic and professional mentorship and support. Uh, our volunteers can offer resume help or mock interviews. Uh, you might have a seasoned software developer talking with a computer science major in Ukraine about IT sector trends. Um, you might have a volunteer ex uh, explaining the basics of writing a college application essay. We have students taking uh, online courses on web design, entrepreneurship, biology, and so much more, um, along with that one-on-one -on -one motivation that only a human can provide, uh, supported by their volunteers. An equally important piece is cultural exchange. And um, this is really a unique chance for students in Ukraine to discover a new country and um, have an opportunity to share their own stories. We actually have volunteers from over 130 nations now, um, although the US, I would say, is the, the biggest source of volunteers. Um, it is a global program. And um, there is an incredible amount of authentic cultural exchange going on within the framework of these authentic one-on-one -on -one relationships. Um, this cultural exchange gives young Ukrainians a global perspective, the feeling of belonging to a global community, the chance to dream bigger. And the final huge benefit, maybe the main one, is friendship and emotional support. Um, you've heard about the incredible challenges that Ukrainian teenagers, children, young people are facing every day. And having a friend across the world, someone who is there for them every week, ready to listen, to emphasize, to care, makes such a difference for every one of our students. So this is just one thread that we tie between a student and volunteer. This is, this is all the positive impacts we get from that connection. And just imagine what happens when we do that at scale. So we've had, um, and this is a little bit out of date, uh, so almost um, 20,000 students and 17,000 volunteers um, in the past, um, few years that we've been running this program and we are looking to reach many, many thousands more. As we grow, we are not simply helping individual people, um, but we're also helping a nation. So this is our, our dream that we can get to a large enough scale that we can have transformative nationwide change. We're hoping to build a globally connected free Ukraine where English fluency is the norm where an entire generation of youth is ready to collaborate, innovate, and rebuild. So what is ENGINE? ENGINE is hope. Hope for Ukrainians and hope for Ukraine. And ENGINE is pretty unique in, in, in um, comparison to many nonprofit programs out there um, for, for a few reasons. So first, um, our model is flexible to meet every student where they are and fulfill their individual needs. Uh, we really believe in this one-on-one -on -one approach. Um, it's it's shown really, really strong results um, in our experience. Um, we can and do work within the broader educational system. Uh, we've partnered with over 100 schools, universities, and nonprofits across Ukraine, including the amazing SAVED, um, which you heard about and hopefully soon teach for Ukraine as well. Um, but we can also move outside the system. We can move quickly. We can disrupt conventions that don't work, and we can work around bureaucracies. And our model is sustainable because our volunteers get as much out of the interactions with their Ukrainian students um, as the students do. So what we're doing isn't charity. It's a relationship of equals. And that's really central to um, to our theory of change. And you can see here just one, one of many heartwarming quotes we get from our volunteers, um, people who say their students have become um, best friends or almost like family members. Um, and we have had volunteers who have actually traveled to Ukraine despite the war just to meet their students in person. Um, so the relationships we build are incredibly powerful and um, impactful on both sides. And all of this is insanely cost effective and scalable. So um, our budget is just $600,000 annually, and um, we're currently serving around 27 current participants, um, which is about 20 staff members. Um, and our volunteers contribute over $5 million of value each year. So we're really leveraging that in a very um, effective way at scale. And we um, were able to maintain really high
um, satisfaction and impact. Um, there's just a couple of our impact numbers that we, we measure among students and volunteers to see what they think of the program and how they're progressing. Um, yeah, I think that's um, great, great. That's, that's great. pretty much it. Um, they, I, I would love to also connect with anyone who uh, who would love to learn more about our work and invite you to um, reach out and love to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Katarina, and uh, that's it's just uh, amazing progress you've made in a in a few short years. How you've grown to such uh, grown to such amazing numbers, uh, you know, uh, over around fifteen thousand on on each side, uh, very roughly roughly speaking. Uh, so we look forward to uh, questions from our our participants. You can please uh, type those in the chat, and if I have trouble seeing them, then uh, I'm sure Melissa will help uh, point them out to me. But uh, meanwhile, perhaps I'll ask the first question as we're waiting uh, for your questions to appear in the chat. And it's for uh, Anna Novosad. Anna, how would you uh, describe uh, how the cooperation works between uh, Save Ed and the local communities, local schools, uh, local uh, local government, perhaps the national governments involved? Could you tell us a little bit about uh, that dynamic briefly? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, uh, nothing is possible at all without the cooperation with the local communities and I would say what, whatever we do is is very much uh, local based you know uh, Ukraine is, is is a huge country and the uh, city in Kyiv you cannot really see a situation um, in the east south and and um, and north of the country because you know uh, one thing to understand is that currently situation in the liberated areas that were liber liberated last year and those that have been liberated a few months ago, uh, these are very different situations. So like we cannot compare what the way, how we can help in Kharkiv or how we can help in Kyiv region because yeah, situations with shellings or with the scale of destruction uh, or with the number of IDPs are very different. And thus there is like no one size fits all uh, in terms of helping to renew access to education. So we at say that we uh, work uh, basically predominantly with the local authorities. We travel around, we do a lot of kind of uh, uh, local needs assessments. We travel, drive around these uh, villages and towns and just to see the situation with our own eyes and also to, uh, in order to come up with the solutions and uh, uh, whatever we we can suggest to the local communities, we can uh, approve with them and then go forward. Uh, but then also when we see that um, some of the approaches that are actually successful, like I, I spoke about the digital learning centers, like an integrated solution of quick um, recovery of access to at least some educational activities. Uh, we were first to roll that out and uh, kind of to create an ecosystem of partners to to help that, uh, like Teach for Ukraine in Ukraine and Engine. Um, and now this is something that pretty much every big player in Ukraine is doing. And there is a huge network of centers um, like that. And the ministry kind of outlines it as their policy in terms of um, access to education. Yeah, but I would say, like, just to say, the, to say the last thing, you know, Ukraine, I think, is is still holding on because of a very decentralized nature of, <laughs> of our living here and uh, of uh, supporting each other. And thus, uh, you know, Kyiv uh, really... Uh, doesn't influence everything and that's really good because people are very horizontally aligned and uh, help uh, very locally. Thank you, thank you Anna. Uh, Oksana, could you tell us a little bit about um, kind of what had perhaps hindered uh, teachers from wanting to teach in more uh, rural areas in the past and you know what, what's what's the way you, you try to inspire them uh, besides perhaps uh, providing some financial reward? Uh, is it also about providing perhaps uh, better uh, facilities, uh, more, you know, is there is there internet in these rural schools, computers, things like that? I mean, I think teachers will say they need resources to do the job as well, right? Uh, yeah, Adrian, definitely. Um, so we were primarily focusing on rural areas before um, the war, right? But uh, now every child in Ukraine has been negatively impacted. So we are trying to focus on the most, um, you know, disadvantaged who are not necessarily, you know, located in rural schools anymore. It can also be about, you know, if you're in a close proximity to the front line and you're still in the big city and your education is, um, you know, suffering. And I think in, especially in those regions, 
kids have not been able to have any kind of, you know, proper learning uh, since the large scale war um, started. Uh, but uh, for us, um, we see a huge, uh, we see a huge uh, need to have the new talent coming into the education sector. Even before the war, the majority of teachers, like we had uh, those teachers who came to the system, um, you know, way uh, at, for, for 30, uh, 40 years, right? And we saw that young people are not uh, choosing the teaching education as their, you know, profession. And we also saw how many kids are lacking access to proper education in these areas. So we, some of our partner schools have not had teacher in math or biology or English for two or four years, right? And if, if, if there is no teacher, you don't have the, the education. One teacher could be teaching four subjects in a row because especially STEM subject, it was extremely hard um, to find um, a teacher like that. On the one hand, we had young people many of whom are, as we see, interested in, you know, uh, switching to education sector and wanting to support, especially the country right now with uh, not necessarily money to donate or they can do that or they can go and join the army, but they can uh, be an inspirational uh, model and mentor to children. We see that especially in small communities, there is a huge brain drain. Ukraine has always been suffering from a brain drain as a country, but especially small communities, when we have our fellows uh, going to like uh, moving to a village like people are so suspicious they simply do not understand why a well-educated young person is leaving Kiev or leave big cities and moving to this uh, remote area right but the best thing happens when we are present there we not only place a, a teacher right we also work with the school leadership I didn't mention that uh, given the time but right now we have the approach when we um, take the uh, transformational approach to um, partnering with the school. Uh, if we are partnering with the school, uh, then not only they get our um, fellow, uh, two fellows or three fellows as teachers, but they also get an extensive training of their school leadership capacity. We saw that um, the more effective was the school leadership, the more equipped they were, the better was the learning process organized during the war. So there is a huge need to work on that capacity as well. So when we come to a school, we make sure that we also uh, add extra added, we also add value in, in strengthening the capacity of teachers. Um, uh, we provide them with uh, smaller grants uh, right now to, for example, refurbish their uh, facilities at the minimum cost. Uh, we don't do uh, big infrastructure support as um as uh, Anna's uh, Charity Foundation Save It does, we do on a much smaller scale, uh, but we just try to be there um, for the school and for the community as a whole. And one big part of our work is implementation of community-based projects that our fellows do usually with their children on the ground. This is what, where, where, you know, children get to see, um, you know, proactiveness initiative uh, in full forest and they get inspired and you know, they see that um, opportunities are not defined by the place of your birth. They are limitless, but you can also and you should also do something in the place where you are, which is about, you know, shaping the future um, no matter what. Right. You can always do that despite the, the circumstances. Thank you, Oksana. If you're joining us late, we remind you that um, uh, we welcome your questions. You can type those in the chat. We'll be uh... Happy to address your question. Uh, my next question would be for uh, Katerina Manoff. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, kind of the mechanics of how you uh, partner uh, your English speakers and your uh, aspiring Ukrainian English speakers? Uh, in other words, I, I understand you have an office or a, a pretty solid big reputation, uh, I'm sorry, representation in Kyiv. And that there's a, there is a process of selection and pairing that's, uh, you know, it involves making sure that the partnerships uh, will work well. Yeah, absolutely. So we've gotten pretty good at the, the mechanics since we've paired so many thousands of people by now. Um, our team is primarily in Ukraine. We're all virtual, actually. We don't have an office, um, but uh, we do have we do have a staff in Ukraine, and which is also great because we're able to to create jobs in Ukraine during this difficult time. Um, but what we do is we um, interview every applicant, every potential student or volunteer uh, via Zoom. Um, we're looking for um, you know their English level and really just trying to get to know them as a as a person. And um, based on that, we have um, a matcher who um, 
does every single match by hand. It's a little, a little bit computer assisted, um, but really um, we found that when we, you know, we really need the human touch to make the matches work. So um, in addition to basics like people's schedules to make sure that they'll, they'll find a convenient time to meet, um, and their gender preferences. So if a female student prefers to work with a female volunteer, we'll help with that. Um, really, we try to um, think about interests and personality. So for example, um, if someone's quieter, we're gonna try not to match two quieter people together. Um, if um, if there's particular interests, um, either professional interests or hobbies. So we have many people um, you know, who are interested in the IT field. And so we try to match them with our volunteers who have experience in IT. Um, we have we might have people who are really into sports or music. Um, with our younger kids, we have volunteers who are really into video games and students who are into video games. So in addition to their regular sessions, they'll go online and play video games together and chat in English. So I think part of that, um, you know, the the um, the impact, um, the the friendships that develop, the connections that develop, um, is really because we're we're able to to make those matches and find the right person. And sometimes we don't get it right, and you know we we provide support throughout the whole program experience to both sides. So if the match isn't working out, um, we will try to help them um, uh, get to a better place, or we will rematch them. Um, so yes, I think that's kind of sort of the the bread and butter what we do um, of um, building these connections and. And um, like I said, we get really good feedback. And that's actually probably one of the most common things we hear is like, oh, how, how did you find just the perfect student for me? How did you find just the perfect volunteer for me? Like you, you know, just based on this brief interview, how were you able to make such a good match? But somehow, somehow it works. Oh, great. That, that's fantastic. Uh, I guess my next question would be to uh, Anna Novosad. Uh, uh, it's my understanding that the Ukrainian uh, school system has kind of been going through a transition uh, from an 11 grade system to a 12 grade system, perhaps to align it more with um, European schools. And might you address a little bit about, um, you know, what that if that change is still continuing and uh, maybe a little bit about, um, you know, Ukraine's integration with the EU and and you know, what's what you're the things you still have to keep in mind during this wartime as you're trying to reform the education. Yeah, you know, thank you, Adrian. I think uh, one of the many things that we have to kind of keep in mind and also preserve in our lives, uh, um, we call it uh, war life balance. Uh, is uh, is um, intent to keep keep up the reforms, you know, keep up the change uh, despite the situation. And uh, school reform is is one of that. I'm very happy that recently. The ministerial team has been changed, and now we have new people who who are ready and willing to pick up and move on with what's been uh, what's been started a few years ago. So, uh, yeah, the the new Ukrainian school reform presupposed a huge change, including to the structure of the schooling uh, system. And uh, we are uh, we we've been one of the few countries uh, who still preserve this uh, eleven year old eleven years um, duration of schooling. And uh, in two thousand twenty seven, we were supposed to transfer to twelve um, twelve year schooling. Um, yeah, so hopefully that that's gonna stay, and uh, the ministry and all the partners, including those sitting here working uh, on that um, as well. So yeah, well, I would say that of course in in the south, in the east, the you know there's little to no space to think about the reforms when you just have one task to survive day to day. However, uh, the rest of the country, center western parts, um, they uh, they still have to be this kind of engines and 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 you know th those uh, who still preserve the changes and uh, um, basically serve as pilots. So yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I guess this would be really to anyone who wants to answer all of you if you keep your answers brief. But I'm curious if you might kind of uh, reemphasize or uh, you know help our funders um, in in terms of thinking about you know. You know, when I perhaps think of education, I think of it as just kind of a, a government thing. But it seems to me that all of you are very much involved in, uh, you know, civil society actually being able to engage in helping uh, improve uh, education and, and deal with the situation and the challenges of the work. Might anybody would like to speak to that as we wrap up? Sana, maybe you. Um, I can just say that people 
when I speak about, um, you know, Ukraine's response and the response of Ukrainians to, um, you know, the large scale invasion, um, a lot of them are asking questions about, right, the, um, or are surprised, especially international uh, donors, how active civil society is. But I think we're doing this because we are, we're, we stand as one united fund and we're not, we're helping here the state, Ukraine, Ukraine's leadership to, um, you know, be able to effectively respond to what's happening to us. Like the number one priority, and I'm sure both Anna and Katarina will agree, it's the defense um, sector, right? It's the it's all the resources, all the attention uh, they need to go there. But the number, but the number two, the most significant, the most strategic, and the most important uh, sector is education. It's about the future. When we recently conducted a study in uh, in, in four frontline regions um, in Ukraine, it's not public yet. But we saw that like 80, 85% of, of uh, mothers who are still based there, they are thinking about moving first and foremost because of education. Education is the number one reason why a lot of women decide to leave the country because they want their kid to be able to go to school safely. And I think, but the majority of them are still in the country. And, you know, what we are doing with uh, Anna and with Katerina, we're just trying to create this opportunities and at least like safe safe space, safe learning space for children to be able to continue education in the country. And we're standing as one united front, right? It's it's not about being better or being more effective than the government. It's being together with the government to help the state, um, you know, still stand um, in different um, sectors. Well, the most uh, significant and the most important one is definitely the defense. Uh 30 seconds, if anybody else wants to chip Yeah, I, I just want to jump in just with a reminder that the Ukrainian government is, you know, 30 some years old. It's the same age as me and Anna and Oksana, right? So um, I think we're, we Ukrainians are aware of that. And that's why, as Oksana said, we work together and we provide that support for maximum impact hand in hand in education and, and other sectors. Anna, anything else? 30 seconds? <laughs> Well, I can only concur with that. And, you know, I'd say that while the government is, is struggling to preserve the basic uh, services and access in access to education, like teacher salaries, like the support to, to the army in terms of like big investments, we are all of us in, in the civil society are trying to kind of fix what's critical and what can be done in a more flexible manner. And I think this is this is the kind of secret of our uh, resilience uh, in here. Well, on the Novosad, Oksana, Matya, Shakatrina Manov, thank you uh, very, very much for participating in our discussion. Thanks very much to our audience. And I toss it back to either Natalie or Melissa to wrap up. Thank you so much, Adrian. We appreciate your time today to join us. And if you are interested in other topics, as Adrian and Natalie mentioned, that this is an ongoing series. So please feel free to reach out if there's a topic that you would uh, be interested in. We might have already done it, so you can dive into the resources, or it might be an up upcoming conversation. So stay tuned for uh, this ongoing series. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you for having us. Take care.